OK, so this workshop is on AlphaZero. Uh, and inside of AlphaZero is this algorithm called MCTS. Um, so quickly, just to prove that this works, I just now started training uh, the, the Finnish network. Let me just show you guys. That is running over on here on this, this side monitor. We'll come back to that at the end. So I'm Andrew. Uh, I like reinforcement learning, basically machines that, that learn to get better on their own by just interacting with the environment. So uh, let's do this in present mode. Um, what is AlphaZero? Uh, AlphaZero is a bot that is most notable for beating the world champion of Go in 2016. Uh, Go is this game you can see on the right. Uh, it's played by placing pieces down on this grid that's 19 by 19, and you capture pieces by fully surrounding them. Um, and so in 2016, they pitted Lee Sidol, who was the current world champion at Go, against this bot, and he lost 4 to 1, uh, which is pretty remarkable for it just being a machine. Um, so DeepMind is the, the company that created uh, AlphaGo and AlphaZero. Um, but the interesting part about this algorithm is that it's not just Go. It, it can play any game. Any game that it has like a structure similar to chess or like a board, if it has boards and pieces, Go can play it. Or if it can be represented as boards and, and pieces. So how does it work? Uh, it uses this structure underneath the hood called MCTS, uh, which stands for Monte Carlo Tree Search. If you hear the word Monte Carlo, uh, I, I, for the longest time, thought Monte Carlo was this really good guy who was great with randomness. If not, uh, there's this place in France called Monte Carlo, and it's their like version of Vegas. So it's, their randomness comes from, from that area. And that's why it's called Monte Carlo like simulation, and in this case, Monte Carlo tree search. So basically, MCTS has four steps, where uh, at any point, you've explored some amount of the game tree. So we're representing our game as boards and then moves you can make from a board. And if, you, let's say, you move a piece or you add a piece onto the board, you now have a new board. So you can move through a tree in that way. Does that make sense? Um, so you have a board, which is like a state, and then any action you take will get you a new board or a new state. And so that is our tree, and that's what we're working with. So what we have is we've represented some amount of our tree in our MCTS tree, I guess. We're using tree for two separate things here. One of them is referring to the actual game tree, and the other one is referring to the structure that we've kept to our own understanding of the game tree. Uh, so our own understanding of the game tree is fuzzy and not quite perfect. That's where that Monte Carlo comes, but we get, make it better and better. And that's how we get better at playing the game. Um, so in the first step of MCTS, we move through our game tree until we find a node that we haven't seen before. And at that point, we expand that node, which just means, like, I ask it, what's the value of, of your node? And that's, that's an interesting problem to deal with, and we, we show how they deal with it and how other people have dealt with it, uh, but we'll get to that. Um, and then, so to, to find that value, you use simulation. And so you can either simulate a random rollout where you go, okay, I'm in this board state. What is my value at here? I can either take random moves until I win or lose, and then that's the value. Or AlphaGo is something more interesting, which we'll talk about in just a second. And then backpropagation is once I know the value of my board state, that affects every board state above me. So if I know I'm going to lose if I enter this board state, I'm going to tell the board state above me that the value of that board is, is low, so I don't want to hit it. Does that make sense? Well, we'll go over this a couple more times. Um, and then once, so this simulation happens many times before you make one move. So basically, this is like the computer thinking about future moves, but it's not actually making these moves in the real game it's playing. Um, so it's, it's like dreaming about future moves. And once it's dreamt a fair amount, um, we select a real move to actually make in the game. So there's a couple things wrong with base Monte Carlo tree search. Um, mainly, like, so, so first off, if you have a tree you don't really know anything about its relation to other parts in the tree. Like if you have a tree node, you don't know if that's just the same tree node rotated. 
Um, and so you can't capture that at all. Um, and if you're taking a node and you want to find its value and you do a random rollout, it's just terrible. Like, like you could win, you could lose, you kind of get the distribution, but you have to take a lot of rolls to figure out the true distribution. Um, and you can't get better between games. If I have a tree search and I lose every game in this tree search, I'm going to always lose every game unless I deepen how far I search that tree. Um, and then some cool stuff about Go. So, so if we're looking at this tree search, we want to, in a classical way, search all the nodes. That would be ideal. We know the true game. If we can search all the nodes, we know we win like this percentage and lose with this percentage. Um, but that's not easy to do. Uh, let's say just in chess, there's a ton of board states in chess, 10 to the 45. You, you wouldn't be able to search that in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, but in Go, the problem is way worse. Uh, there's 10 to the 82 atoms in the universe and 10 to the 170 board states, um, which is just double 82, right? But that means it's squared. So for every atom in the universe, there's an entire another universe, and when you sum all of those, you get the board states of Go. You can't search that. That's not going to be reasonable. Um, so, but, but in the same way, we've beaten someone at Go, so we figured out a way, and that's amazing. Um, so what Alpha Zero or Alpha Go does is when I reach a new node, a node I haven't seen before, I have a neural network that will tell me what's the value of that node. So I don't have to do a random rollout. I have this mysterical, mysterical box that can tell me, okay, you're going to lose 30% of the time or you're going to win 40% of the time. So this is a good or bad board state. Um, and then on top of that, we have a policy which lets us make non-optimal moves. So in like MCTS, you can think of, I'm gonna always generally go towards the board where I win the most often, but you're not necessarily gonna always win. Like, what if that win is very easy to block? So it's not actually a often win. The policy lets us take moves away from those. We can, we can go to states that you win less often, but you actually win more often. Um, but then the, the question becomes, how do you get that data? Like, I don't actually have this mysterical box yet. I just have a computer, and I want it to be a mysterical box. Um, so let's go through how they do that. It's fun stuff. So to keep track of our uh, MCTS tree, we're going to need a couple things. One of them is just the value of the board. That's going to be what pops out of our network. Uh, and then another one, we need the value of all the boards underneath. This is how we're going to, part of how we're going to make decisions on where we're going to go to next. Uh, then we need a policy that's also going to come out of our network. And then visit counts. This is um, also used when uh, trying to figure out which node to expand. I don't know if you guys have heard about this before, but there's this trade off between exploitation and exploration in reinforcement learning. Like if I know something is good, I want to go for it. But I also want to explore new nodes in case there's a better option. So that N node, the, the visit counts, will help us uh, find nodes that, that we haven't visited so many times and could have uh, high values. So the step one of MCTS, we're going to move within the tree we've seen before. And so if I'm at, let's say, like that node on the second road, how do I know which of my three children to go to? We have an equation for it which shall help us. So basically what this equation does is I look at all of my actions underneath me, and those represent the, um, the lines, right? So that's an action will take me from one state to another state. And then I have a policy between my state and another state. And then you can see that summation up there. What it's going to do is uh, I'm going to sum all of the possible actions and divide it by how many times have I visited this node. So what the right side will do is it's our exploration term. So if I haven't visited a node very much, it's going to be a large number divided by a smaller number. Does this make sense? Yeah? Yes. Yes. So it is state comma action. 
So um, I'm in a state, uh, I'm on one of these nodes, and then each of my actions is one of these legs. And we're trying to find which action is the best. So that would be the same as which action has the highest upper confidence bound, given that I'm in each state. Or I'm in this state, right? So like, uh, when I'm calculating all of these, this number here, the state, won't change. Does that make sense? Um, so I'm looking at my state, I wanna look at all my child actions, and I wanna choose the one that I haven't visited the most, and uh, bounded also by, is it a good or bad node? Like, Q is our value, so let's say like, this node down here, I haven't visited ver it very much at all, but I know I lose if I go there, I'm still not gonna choose that node. Um, so in this case, there are basically immediate child ones, right? Yes. Each of those represented by Q. Yes, they, so Q sub state comma action. So let's say we call this action one, action two, action three. Does that make sense? Uh, then, so our state would be this node. So the Q of this action uh, would be Q state this state comma this action. Does that make sense? Yes, when we're making this decision, the state is constant. But we can also do this same calculation up on this state. But we'll do that in a different iteration. Does, yeah. So let's say I'm, I'm still, so this triangle represents the MCTS tree I've, I've seen before. I've already explored this area, and I wanna look at which of my children to go to. Um, I'm at the root node, I have to figure out which of these children I wanna go to. So I use this equation to figure that out. Um, so I have to look at each one of my children's uh, cues or values and my policy along those children. Um, I don't know if this is easier for you to understand, but if I were to represent Q as a, um, a vector of the size of the number of children I have, uh, then I could have a Q for each state. So does that make more sense or less sense? Yes, so as soon as I get down here, I'm out of the ones I've seen, but I'm still up here and I want to move in my tree. Yes, um, so that's that simulation versus moving within the tree. Nodes that I've already explored, I know their value, at least kind of, and so I don't want to explore them again. I want to find the first node that I haven't explored or that, that I haven't explored but is most interesting to me. And the way I define most interesting is it has not been visited much and it has a high value that I, I think it has. So we can infer just by looking at the triangle, the first node on, on the first node. Yeah. Uh-huh. They could, um, so let's say, so I guess what might be confusing here is that I'm gonna do this simulation like hundreds of times. Um, or let's, let's just say I do it 25 times. So the first time, I'm gonna expand just this top node. The second time, I'm gonna expand this node and then choose one of its children to expand. Uh, and the third time, I'm gonna expand, or I'm not gonna expand this node, I've already expanded it. I'm gonna look at its children. If I haven't expanded it, I'm gonna expand that node. I'm, I'm being more confusing than need, is needed. One sec, let me go back to the four. What, what does expansion look like? Is it the first search or is it like, if it starts to move and it goes to the left, and then it goes to the right? It, um, So there's always one like base board, right? Uh, so that you start with an empty board, um, and it's it's kind of like a breadth first search, but instead of just choosing the first node, you choose the the node that satisfies this equation to be the highest. Um, so basically, like if I haven't visited any of my nodes, I choose the first node because they all have the same value, and then it's it's just basically random at that point. But once I've visited even one node. Um, 
a lot of these, I'll have a value for that node, and I will have a new visit count. So um, let's let's do a quick example on the port. Um, because it is confusing. Let's say we're playing tic-tac-toe. Uh, that marker doesn't work. So, I have a board that looks like this. Um, let's go near, or we'll start with the very top. So, let's say I've already played some uh, simulations. So I have some tree of my tic-tac-toe board already done in my MCTS tree, that triangle. Um, so, in my first position, I can put X in nine places. Uh, I'm not going to draw out all nine. But, so, uh, I can have my network give me a number for this. I'm going to give that number, let's say, like 0.4. Um, and so, what I do with that number is I give it to this line. And so, that will be the Q of this state with this action. Does that make sense? So uh, let's say Q is equal to 0.4. And then same here, we'll have a Q is equal to 0.3. Q is equal to negative 0.2. It's bad to go to the state, state for some reason. Um, yeah, you can have negative, right? It can be not advantageous to go to a state. Um, because uh, the way we represent winning is if you win, it's a positive one. If you lose, it's a negative one. So you can have negative. So in this case, it's the it's a probability that you're going to win in this state, but negative meaning the probability that the other person will win. Does that kind of make sense? It's not a strict probability. So is it negative one, positive one? Yes. So you can expect in tic-tac-toe, because there's no like way to win, the all of these values should be eventually around zero. Uh, because I know that I can't win tic-tac-toe with any specific strategy. So the value of going to this next node should be around zero. Uh, but you'll gain positive and negatives as you go further down. Does that make sense? Okay, so now we need P, which is our policy. Uh, our policy, let's say, just for simplicity, is one third, uh, one half. This is uh, interesting. The policy doesn't have to sum to one. It's not like a probability distribution. So um, I'm just going to make this one fourth. So if I wanted to know which of my children to go to, um, I would just take these numbers. Uh, let's do it. So it would be 0.4 plus um, C punct is a interesting variable. It is, it controls kind of exploration. So if your C punct is very large, it means that you're going to go towards nodes that you haven't visited before. Does that make sense? Um, how, how does it encourage, how does that algorithm yeah. encourage the number to want to explore? So it, it all comes from this N term, uh, which is, N is visit counts. <coughs> um, so if I visited an, a state or I've traveled along a state action pair a bunch of times, then it's uh, the state action pair N S comma A will be large. Um, whereas that top term, which is the square root of all of the times I visited all the subchildren, which is equivalent to saying how many times have I visited this node? Does that make sense? Right, so, so for every uh, child or every action of, of this state, how many times have I visited, sum those up. So that will get one number that's the same for all of these. Um, and so you get a ratio. Uh, let's say I visited uh, this one one third of the time. Uh, uh, I can't do fractions. Let's do five sixths, nope. Uh, one sixth, and then the rest of it is three sixth. Um, so if I visited this one uh, one third of the time, I'm going to want to see it more. Or er, sorry, how do I say this best? 
Oh, wait. Yeah, so um, A in all of these is the action that is taken. Um, so A is one of those lines. So I have a state and then I have an action. And that action in this case is putting this X in the top left corner. And the B is along the summation. So it's the sum over all the actions. Does that make sense? Um, B is one, two, and three. So like, let's name these real fast. I'm gonna switch these to dictionaries. So we're gonna call this action one, action two, and action three. Um, so if I want to sum for every B, uh, it would be the same as summing from one to three. Does that make sense of n of s comma b? Uh, so I look at all of my children of this state and I sum them up uh, and it's just the, how many times have I visited any of my children? Does that make sense? Yeah? So every time alpha, I mean alpha zero plays against something else, it's <laughs> kind of improving and then improving this algorithm since it's not improving. Mm -hmm. It's not explored yet. And the, if it is in the algorithm, it just, just tracks it and then takes it back. Yes. Um, and what it does on top of that is when it reaches a new node, it uses neural networks to make itself even better. So, like, what we're talking about here is still just how MCTS works. And you can see, kind of, that if you were to do this infinitely times, infinitely many times, you would get the true distribution of games and like you would be able to play the game perfectly. Um, but we don't have infinite time. There's, there's too many states. Uh, so we have to explore the tree specifically in the best way that we can while still exploring. Is there like, is there a cutoff? So obviously there, there are more states than there's Yes. I'm happy you said that because that's exactly what MCTS helps you with. Every one of these simulations takes like a finite amount of time. We, we know generally like the upper bound of how much time it's gonna take to do a simulation. Um, it, you know, it, it, you have to move through the tree and then you'll reach a new node and it takes a little bit of time to, to compute that new node. But that's not gonna be infinite time. Um, so what you can do is your cutoff can be, do I have enough time to do another simulation? And if I don't, I just, I just, don't do another simulation, and I choose my actions from the simulations I have done. Uh, we will get into how it chooses its actions from a simulation, or from the simulations, in just a second. Does that make sense? Um, so, for now, just, we have to understand that this, this U term will let us explore and exploit as we're moving through our MCTS tree, and we're about to reach new nodes. So uh, once we reach a new node, we have to expand it. And basically what expanding does is there's a bunch of steps attached to it, but it's just like housekeeping. Like we're just making the tree all nice, making sure it's happy so that we can use our tree nicely. And then three is called simulation. And the old way that people used to do this, the reason this has the name Monte Carlo is because they would get to a node, let's say like this, node, and then they would be like, okay, I'm just gonna go take random actions. Anything that's valid, I'll take it, and then I will, I'll just go, and then I'll get a plus or minus one. I either won the game, or I didn't. S simple as that. And that is now the value of this node. So let's say I, perhaps I lost it. So now this has a value of negative one, which isn't super good, right? Like, we don't know if we're gonna lose in that state or not but we believe currently that we will. But what alpha zero does is it doesn't do that silly simulation where it goes and gets a positive negative one. Instead, it takes a neural network, looks at this board state and says, what percentage am I gonna win with? Is it gonna be like, you know, 
Am I gonna win with 40% or is it very close to zero? And so we can get a fuzzy representation of our, our actual ability to win in that state. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. So. At what point in a normal money public research does it make a random rollout and it decides a very simple probability? That's in uh, this step three, this simulation step. So I move through my uh, tree with steps one. You can kind of see one tree selection. And so I move through my tree, and then at some point I'll hit a new node. And so that point I expand that node, and then I do a simulation on that node. So what differs is that step three. Do I do a random rollout for my simulation, or do I use a neural network to try and understand that board and get that simulation value? Does that make sense? Does the define use, does it make random moves for exploration? No. Um, it always either uses this tree, um, this tree uh, policy, you can call it, or it uses the neural network to expand a node. It, it doesn't need to use uh, random rollouts. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah, you can see random rollouts bad. Neural network's good. <laughs> okay, four. Now, we've talked a little bit about this, but once I have a value of a node, I want to update my tree. So uh, let's say I, I've gotten this one to say negative one. I don't think that's good, but I, I get to keep going. And so if I end up going on this node again, I can get its children, and those children are gonna have values, uh, let's say positive one, positive one, negative one. This then becomes the rolling average of those. Uh, this is an example where if you sum up these four, you'll get an average of zero. So the new value of this is going to be zero. I now think it's equally likely that I win or lose in that state. And maybe I'll go more on this one, and then I'll get like plus one, plus one, uh, plus one, negative one, and now I'll get like kind of like a three-fourths sort of scenario. Um, and that will then update this one, so I won't win with as much certainty now. Does that make sense? Uh, so we keep kind of a rolling average of the ones above us. Um, to let us like keep expanding underneath, if that makes sense. These, these rolling averages, are, they, are you simplifying it for the sake of explanation, or is that how the algorithm No, it's actually, you just keep a rolling average of everything underneath you. The interesting thing is that we kind of recursively move down and then recursively pass back up the value. Does that make sense? Um, so, is there any, yeah, yeah, you can see there's a, the rolling average equation. Um, so we have now made a bunch of, ra or not random moves, we've now simulated a bunch of times. Um, and so that gets us a lot of, um, we've now selected an action a bunch of times, if that makes sense. So the way that we actually select our final actions is we look at, how many times did I move across this node? Let's say I moved across this node 15 times. And then I moved across this node three times. That's a bad three. And then I moved across this node 25 times. Um, there, then I wanna select my action. So there's this parameter called temperature that you can read here. Basically what we do is we turn uh, this array, let's just turn it into an array. Um, 15, 3, 25. We turn it into probabilities, so we normalize it. Um, but before we normalize it, we take it to a power, and that, that power is one over temp. So you can imagine if temp is one, uh, it's just the same as these numbers, right, one over one is one. Uh, but if temp is zero, it's one over zero, which is infinite, and so whichever one grows the fastest is the one with the largest base, so it turns into just 
which one of these is the biggest? And that's the action we choose. So you're normalizing the way Yes, if temp is zero. So there's two times we use this algorithm. Um, one, when we're trying to learn, and when we're trying to learn, we set temp to one. And then when we wanna actually play someone and like do our best, we set temp to zero. And that will always give us the best action. Whereas temp to one lets us, like, we can take all right actions uh, and we can take bad actions with low probability. Yes. Not the number of moves, or um, it's the greatest number of times I chose it when using that equation from earlier. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Basically, it's like the inner tree policy. So when that policy, it, it applies that policy for every one of those nodes, and then it wants the maximum. It's. Yes, it wants to choose the ones that the policy preferred um, when it's exploring. What do you mean when you're training or when you're actually learning? So we're, we're going to get to that soon, but basically uh, when we're training, we have to make some data that will make the, the net better. So actually, here, it's just the next slide. Um, uh, so we've just played a bunch of games, and now we want to make our little black box better. Um, so. We have used it for two things. We've used it as a value network, which just goes, I have a tic-tac-toe board, and I want a number, let's say 0.3. And there's another one where I have a tic-tac-toe board, and I want nine numbers where each number is how likely I am to choose that action. Uh, so it, it is how likely am, am I to choose like the top left, uh, the top middle, that, all those nine. Um, and we will set the ones that aren't valid to zero so we don't have to worry about anything like that. Our neural network doesn't have to know about that. Um, so this is going to be an array that is nine times one. Does that make sense? There's, <laughs> No, um, so anytime I'm moving in a, in a tic-tac-toe board, there's nine moves I can make, um, which like, as soon as this X is here, I can't move to that same spot, um, but we're gonna just zero out those values, uh, so it, should, it doesn't matter. Um, so we just, what we ask from the network is, I'm looking at this board, what move should I make? Um, and so we wanna train that and make that better. And how do we do that is an, is, is an interesting problem, right? Um, but while we were moving around and doing our simulations, we made data, and we want to use that data to get better. So you can kind of imagine as you go deeper in the tree, you get a better idea of what you should be doing out. So we're going to train our policy on what the, the tree thought we should do at the very end. Um, so when we actually made our move, what did the tree think was the best action? And with what probability did it think that was the best action? So this, this action probability is, is what we train our network on, um, which is just that I'm looking at, let's say, this, these three actions. In reality, there's six more. But um, I'm going to train my network on the regularized values of these. Uh, does that make sense? Yes. Oh, that's just uh, an image of a regular classification net that does not actually, uh, basically our, our data is of size uh, nine to nine, so it's, it's a ninth dimensional array to a ninth dimensional array. We can't visualize that, um, but what, uh, what I was trying to implement or show here is that it's just a regular classification problem now. We have input data and we have output data and we know how to do supervised learning to, to make our input output that output. That makes sense. Okay, so same with value network. Uh, we played games, and we either won or lost in a position, and so we're going to train our network on if we won in that position or if we lost in that position. Um, so it, let me say that a little bit better. 
like whenever I made like this move to this move, I like actually made this move. I'm gonna mark this as we won the game, we won the game, and I'm gonna train the network to say, okay, with this this start, that's a one. I actually won it. And so we'll have a large amount of training data. So we'll have a lot of, okay, this board means I win. We'll also have a bunch that say this board means I lose. And it will get an average. Does that make sense? So uh, it, let's bring down the dimensionality. Let's say I just have, um, I have a board that can be represented by numbers. And so it will just, somehow I can represent my number, or my board as, as two numbers. Um, and so at each, let's say this is uh, board one, so this is our, our board in space, right? Like that represents a board. We're gonna get a bunch of examples where this is a positive one and another bunch of examples where this is a negative one. And so it will have to learn like, what do I actually classify this as? Uh, but it doesn't have to classify it as positive or negative one. It can choose, uh, you know, 0.4. And if that is the number that minimizes the loss between the positive ones and the negative ones, that is the, the correct average that it would choose. So, oh, I see. Is that um, classification? Yes, it's just in, in nine dimensions for, because it's, it's a tic-tac-toe board. No it's impossible. You could do, yeah, no. Yeah, I'm sure it would look awesome. I don't know, but sadly we can't draw it. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, oh yeah. You're, you're talking about like you know we are training our network on x to y. Um, so our x's in this case are tic tac toe boards. So they're board states. Um, and then our y's in this case are, uh, in the case of value, they are just the positive one and negative ones. So that's just going to be plus or minus one. Uh, or in the case of policy, it's going to be a nine by one array, which is the output of that function. Does that make sense? And for X and N states, what does that mean? Oh, um, so N is the m number of times we visited it. And then state is like a tic-tac-toe board. So you can think N sub state is the same as summing uh, or as getting out all of the individual visit counts of each of its children's actions. Um, right, like so N of this, uh, N of this board state, let's just draw it in there, would be in this case 15, 3, 25. Yes, it's represented as a nine by one vector. The temperature is already taken care of. No, because we've we've already like we, we use a value for temperature. Uh, so we have one value that we use when we're selecting nodes, uh, and we do that during the training period. And then from the training period, we get data out, and so that data already has it evaluated with with temperature. Yes. Um, after it's played against itself. Oh, this is important. This is very important. Um, it doesn't train by like, like playing against a, a static robot. It trains by playing against itself. So all it does is it goes into a game with itself and it plays tic-tac-toe and then whoever wins gets positive training data, whoever loses gets negative training data, but they, it's the same network, right? So so it trains on all of that data. Um, general adversarial networks are slightly different from, from reinforcement learning. Um, reinforcement learning has this loop and, and we're about to come to the full circle of the loop. But what we've done is we've played tic-tac-toe and we've gotten data out 
that we can then train on, and we're going to train on that data and then go back in, if that makes sense. Are both versions of the neural network using the same, the same policy, the same algorithm? Yes. It, are they playing the same moves against each other? Um, well, they're playing two different, like one is playing X's and one is playing O's. So their moves are going to be different because they're different characters. And because of this, uh, because like in the case of this one where you have 15, 3, and 25 in your ends uh, or your visit counts, um, you won't always make the same move uh, because like you're not choosing the best move, you're choosing moves with this probability, which is where that, that temperature parameter comes in. Um, so like, let's just go back one slide. When we're choosing our actual action to make, we choose it by taking a random choice where the probabilities of taking each action is the action probabilities, which is just that temperature um, vector. Okay. Anyone have any questions? Cool. So, that had everything on that slide? Yeah. So how are we going to do this with the neural network? Um, these are not actual sizes, um, but I just wanted to show the general idea of the network. So what we're going to do is we have our 9 by 1 input. What we've done is we've taken our 3 by 3 tic-tac-toe board and we've flattened it out. So now it's just 9 by 1. Uh, we're going to run it through some middleman layers. What these are going to do is take the tic-tac-toe board and expand it out into a higher representation. So like we can do some like operations on it to make it more useful to us. And then we're going to have two networks that take that middleman uh, rep representation and they either go to value output or the policy output, and we've talked about those before. Um, so the interesting thing is that PyTorch lets us train this whole thing with one like backup step. Uh, we'll get to that soon, but it's cool stuff. So. So like why, we've talked about this a little bit, but why does like this work? Basically what it's doing is it's, it's playing against itself, it's making training data, so from that training data it updates its value function very, pretty well, um, and then once it's updated its value function, it goes back into MCTS, it chooses different nodes, which means that it would choose a different policy, and then it trains on that policy, and then it has a new policy, so it's going to reach different nodes, so it's going to get a new value function. Uh, and so it, it's this feedback loop where it gets better at value and then policy and value and policy all at once. And it gets better at the game overall. Um, and the reason this is so weird is because it works for any game, right? Like anything that has states and actions, it can deal with. So I guess that explains a little bit of why there's a lot of stuff you have to keep track of. Because uh, if we're just trying to solve tic-tac-toe, like you can, you can search the whole tree. But if you're trying to solve Go, you need a lot more like structure. Yes, um, fully observable is the word that you like. Yeah. So, here's the, the thing. Does this ever, like, go terribly wrong? If I have a value function and I take policy, or take actions according to my policy, do I ever hit, like, all the wrong things? And then, like, if you hit all the wrong things, you end up with this training data that is not representationally significant to the actual game. Like, it, it doesn't help you play the game any better. Um, so, that's bad. We don't want that. And it can happen. Um, but, luckily, luckily, Mad Max solved this problem. Uh, you need the Thunderdome. So, we have the pit, where two bots enter, one bot leaves. We train our network from the training data, and then we pit it against its old self without the training data. And if it's better than its old self, we can say it's strictly better at tic-tac-toe than its old self. So, we accept it. Otherwise, we have to train for a little bit longer. Um, but I just like the Thunderdome idea. 
Uh, the interesting thing is, this works for tic-tac-toe. Like we can say, if I beat you at tic-tac-toe in like every way, I'm strictly better at tic-tac-toe than you. But is that true of like a three-player game? Does anyone have any ideas? No, like in like a different game. Like let's say I'm playing tic-tac-toe uh, with a bigger board, uh, but let's say it's like a, a four by four board, but I have X, O, and triangle. You can't apply this because there are scenarios where being better than circle at the game uh, doesn't actually make you better at triple tic-tac-toe in any way because you have to like be better, you have to be able to accommodate both circle and triangle's policies. It's, it's a whole fun thing that you guys should look into if you're interested. Uh, but in two player games, we can say if I'm better than you at tic-tac-toe, I'm strictly better than everyone below you as well. Um, so I've gotten better at the game overall. So we have a little bit of code. Um, feel free to copy this link. It's gonna take you to a Google Colab link that you can then, um, you, you push to your own Google Colab. Open yeah, open Playground. Um, I don't want to close this down. How are we doing on time? Okay. Um, once you get in there, you should see that it's only like four lines, um, which is a little disconcerting. Uh, but we're going to edit the code inside of Colab. This just makes our dependencies super easy to deal with. If you have PyTorch installed, uh, you can just clone the GitHub link to your own computer. Uh, but it doesn't really matter. You can do either, either way. So does everyone have this link? I'll leave it up for like a second longer. Um, so if we want to run this locally, we have to have high, high installed. Yes. Um, it's the only difficult dependency. It has like a little, there's a little hiccup with it that I didn't want to have everyone deal with. Um, but it's not too bad to download. So I'm going to pull mine over. Okay. So first things first, you want to mount your drive in Google Colab. This just lets you access your files. It's going to ask for an authorization code. This is nothing too bad. It's going to give you a link that you copy. And you paste it into here. And then in a second, there we go. Then you want to clone the repository, and you see this little sidebar? You're going to pop that out and go to Files, and you should see now Alpha Zero in your files. Um, oh, okay. So, is everyone at this stage? What we're going to do is go into Alpha Zero and check out tabularmodel.py. Uh, this is called tabular model because uh, the way that we represent all these Qs, Ns, and, and pol policies, Ps, is like a table of values. It's not the best name, but it's something. Um, and then editing in Colab is a little weird. We're going to take this little window. And you can only grab it by the bottom right corner. Is that big enough? Wait, sorry, where did you paste the, where did you copy on the... Oh, um, so you, you should see a little, um, open this URL in your browser. Cool. 
Um, okay. Let me know when you guys are at tabular model with it open up. I'm going to increase the size of this. Okay. Hopefully that is big enough because it is huge. Yes, this will be on the video. <laughs> okay. So, um, if you're having trouble, make sure that you open it in Playground um, and follow the steps, and you should be able to open that Files folder. Yes, so um, this is an interesting thing. PyTorch uh, uses, PyTorch makes models in an interesting way. What you do is you specify your layers, then you specify a forward function. The forward function just lets you um, make the actual output. Um, the reason that you specify a forwards function is that PyTorch then specifies for you a backwards function that updates all your weights. And that's like how basic neural networks work. You have a bunch of weights and you want to update them to be as good as you can get them. Um, so, uh, if you remember earlier that big picture, we're going to just write out what that neural network actually looks like in PyTorch. Um, so, let's just get to it. So we have this super, and that just uh, is PyTorch's way of initializing a model. You need to do that when you import nn.module. Um, so if we have an input layer, that's going to be, if you look at the uh, imports above, there's the nn module, which holds all your layers for PyTorch. So nn.linear gets you a linear layer between the first number and the second number. So if I want to take in a flattened tic-tac-toe board and output something like 256, something a bigger representation, I could do that. Um, and then I want to, oop. Then I want to have some hidden layers. And that's just going to go from where we already are, 256, to, let's say, 512. Doesn't really. We're just trying to give the network enough brain power to think. So uh, when you're making a neural network, you have your input nodes. And so in that case, it's nine for us. And then the next one is the amount of nodes in your next layer. So. Does that make sense? Like you have, you start out with a neural network that has nine nodes and then it goes out to let's say have 256 nodes or something like that. Uh, and it's just a fully connected, dense layer like this. I'm not gonna draw all these lines, but you get the idea. It's, it's gonna be fully connected between nine and 256 and then fully connected between 256 and 512. Does this make sense? Have people worked with PyTorch before? Have people worked with Keras before? Or like TensorFlow? Okay. PyTorch, uh, the reason people like it is it's kind of like a more Pythonic way than TensorFlow to, to make stuff. So in TensorFlow, you have this big graph and the, the graph is king. You make this graph and then you run stuff through it and you run stuff backwards. In PyTorch, everything is little modules. And so you have, I make all these modules I run my bits module by module, and then I can back up in this kind of object-oriented way. Uh, so that's why people like PyTorch. It, yes? I think so. Uh, we might have used... Oh, thank you. Yeah. So... Um, for now, we'll just keep that, 
and then we want to have we want to take our, our layer and then go to a value function and a policy uh, sorry a, a value model and a policy model so let's go make those our middle representation is what this hidden layer represents so policy output is just gonna um, output is going to be a linear between that 512 representation and if it's a policy it has nine outputs so it's just going to be nine um, and then we have a value output and that's again going to go from that 512 but this time only down to one value and then this is a little weird. We need to define a sigmoid function uh, in PyTorch. Uh, you like you have to define define certain uh, activation functions before you run them. This is just one of them. So uh, I'm going to call self dot sigmoid is equal to uh, and then dot sigmoid. Does everyone know what a sigmoid function is? Cool, cool, cool. Sigmoid function is an activation function. Activation functions are used on nodes uh, so that you can take a value and put it between two bounds that you want it to be. So the sigmoid function uh, looks like this, and it goes between 1 and 0. So let's say I put the value negative 10 on the sigmoid function. I'm going to go out here and I'm going to get a value that's pretty close to zero. And then if I put a really positive value, I'm going to get a value over here that's pretty close to one. And then if I have a percentage, I'm going to get a nice gradient. So uh, the sigmoid of zero is 0.5. Um, so we're going to apply this to the output of our policies so that we have percentages. Yes. Um, so in this particular case, we want semi percentages looking lo things that look like percentages. So things that are bound between zero and one. So Relu has the ability to go to infin or infinity. Uh, so it's not the best choice for that one. But there are places where Relu is super nice. And in fact, later we're going to use tanh, uh, which is just it's the same function except for it's zero goes through zero. If I can draw correctly. Yeah, so tan h goes between negative 1 and 1. So we use the activation functions where we want to kind of put a little bit of a bounds on it. Um, and if you're interested, there's more stuff about why we use the activation functions, but we'll get to that later. So uh, we've, we've now made all the stuff we need for our model. Now we have to do the PyTorch forward method, which is just how we get a value from an input. So we're gonna, we know that observation is what's coming in. The observation is going to be 9 times 1. Um, so let us do that middle representation first. So x is equal to, so now x is a 512 vector. We've taken it from 9 to 512. Um, and then we're going to take it up to up to, or sorry, it was uh, 128. Now it's up to 512. Right, like we're, we're increasing it. And now we're going to bring it down to policy. Uh, and then we also want our value out. And then we're going to return both policy and value. I left that in just because I didn't want to forget the ordering. So this is just how you do forwarding in PyTorch. Cool. Give everyone a second to copy that down. Yes. Um, 
So basically, forward is like, I've got my big box that's my neural network. Uh, forward is just, I want to put something in that box. So in this case, forward is, I want to put a tic-tac-toe board into this box. And then out of that box, I want to get my, you know, my value and my policy. Um, so forward is, is what you call when you, you want to use your network. Um, cool. So let's go down to the next to do. Does everyone have it copied down? Cool. Um, so here, is this correct? I don't think they to do is correct. Um, there we go. We're going to go down to the train function and maybe come back to that to do. Uh, so when we want to train our network, let's say we're, we're given the data, and the data is in the form, uh, the data format we're going to be given is, it's going to be a tic-tac-toe board, a policy, and then value. So it's just going to be a bunch of these. There's going to be, for every game we played, there'll be around nine of these. And they're going to be all on a big list. And the first thing we want to do is take that list and randomize it. Because if we train sequentially, we're going to learn kind of weird uh, like spaces about the data. We're going to like get all of the ones where you have zeros on the, the beginning state at the same time. That makes sense? So we're just going to randomize that data first. Luckily, Num NumPy has a random dot shuffle. Um, so then we want to split it out. This is just a Python function, uh, the zip function. If you give it a list, we'll zip those lists together. So. There's the, here, I'll write out the line and then we can talk about it. So, has anyone used the star in Python before? What? Basically what it does is it expands it. So, uh, if I use the star on this, I'm going to get out board, comma, like I'm, I'm going to pull them out. If I do it on a list of many of these, uh, what I'm going to get is I'm going to get a list of all these, and then all P's, and then all V's, and that's what we want. Uh, data, yes, is a 2D array where one dimension is each sample, the second dimension is board policy value. So we're exploding the algorithm, and now we just have board policy value in their own arrays. This is just, just to, to help us with training, because we only want to train all of our boards, all of our values and policies. Um, cool. Where's our next to do? Okay, losses in PyTorch. Um, you can see here I'm doing self.optimizer.0grad. PyTorch has these optimizer objects. What they do is they hold all the, uh, all the weights of the model and they help with optimization. They, they have their own ways of doing things. There's a couple optimizers. But what you do is before each time you train, you zero out all the, the gradients, um, and then you make gradients through a loss, and then you update those gradients, and then you zero them all out again. So we'll see that as we go through. So policy loss. Um, how do we know, how do we make our policy better? We want to compare what our model outputted to what we want our policy to be. 
and we know what our wanna, we want our policy to be from that actions probabilities earlier that we already collected as data. So first, let's just get like our predictions from the network. Uh, I'm hiding a little bit of stuff here, like self.model calls uh, self.model.forward. It calls that earlier thing that we wrote. Um, you don't have to explicitly call .forward on PyTorch objects. It's pretty cool like that. Um, did I spell those correctly? Cool. So the policy loss is just going to be Okay, this is also a little weird. So it just says self.policy loss, but earlier uh, we, we said what policy loss was. I'm gonna scroll up just a little bit. Um, so self.policy loss is just a, it's a fancy word for how far away are these two distributions I want to make them close. Um, and then our value loss is mean squared error, which is just how far away are these two points? I want to make them close. Um, so if we go back down to policy loss. Okay. Oh, where'd it go? Did I delete it as I left? No, oh, no, here it is. Nice. Okay, um, so value loss is the same thing. V loss. Value loss. Value predictions. Okay, and then here we have the coolest thing about PyTorch, in my opinion. Um, total loss. We're about to. It's just those two losses added up. And um, this is PyTorch being cool. It takes those losses and it, it still is connected to the network. So I can call uh, total loss dot backward. And this is a little high level for the amount of time we're gonna spend on it. But if I have my big network and I have a loss function, I can call dot backward on it and it will go, okay, I'm this far away from where I want to be. I'm going to make a gradient that would update me in the right direction. Um, and it will do that through additions, through multiplications. It will backtrack all that information. Um, so you can, you can write PyTorch layers if you understand this sort of backtracking thing. Um, so at this point, we've, we've done our backward loss. So we're going to back that up, and then we do an optimizer step. This is all inside of a loop, and so it will just keep getting better and better. And where is the save function? Because I don't want to lose all this. Saving, you can do control S. Okay, and then I'm gonna zoom back out. And if we have done everything correctly, this should run no worries. What do we got? <laughs> Policy output, I definitely spelled it wrong. Um, oh, I didn't name. Oh, nope, this one. Self that, oh, I cannot search that. Okay, okay. I think I know where it is. Does what we did make sense to most people? I may have gotten a little ambitious. Um, <laughs> but what this error is coming from is it's saying that we don't have policy output. Policy is equal to self.policy output. So that's back in our module. 
we don't have a self.policy output. Ah, because I didn't. I did the <laughs> output. Okay. We're going to save this. Um, that is, I think it is line, should be before 91. In, sorry, in tabular module, the problem was that right up here in here, we misspelled uh, policy output. You might have spelled it correctly because you're not. Yeah, because <laughs> you have the ability to spell, unlike me. Okay, let's try running that. See what the new, oh! <laughs> That, that was genuine. Uh, so, so it's running now. Um, you can see it's, it's now competing in the pit to see if it's getting better. Uh, and the first time it saves, it outputs that wonky stuff. But it won 13 out of 50, but and it tied 20 of them. This is training in real time. Um, roughly... I would say, like, it, it depends how you tune your hyperparameters. Like, if you choose a low one, you'll audit, you'll actually reach the, the correct solution. But a bigger one can train in, like, 45 minutes. So, like, you won't get to optimal, but you'll get very close. Um, so what I think the best solution to do is go for a big, uh, a big learning rate and then bring it down. Uh, but remember, earlier, I was like, oh, I'm going to start this training. Let's see how that went. <laughs> Um, bringing it over, and this is all training on the cloud. Uh, when I was training this on my local computer, I was just blowing hot air out of the side of my machine. Uh, but this is all in the cloud, so it doesn't like destroy your computer. So that's good. Um, so it just so it's losing a bunch of times, but it's losing and tying most of the games, which means that it, it's taking a new step. Like I'm training to learn something that's actually weaker. And it's being exploited by this better AI, which is the one that we're keeping right now. So let's stop that training. This, is, this started before we or started training right as we started. And we're going to play against it. There's this uh, other script called play against the AI. It just runs the AI. Um, let's. Oh, it's OK. There we go. So let's say we go to second. It chose the top right corner. Anyone have any positions they want to choose? Anything but the center? <laughs> the center is the correct option. Uh, but let, let's say we don't pick the center. Um, so if you pick the center, it's a tie in an optimal AI. But if you don't pick the center, uh, an optimal AI can take advantage of it. So if I choose, let's say, like 2-2, two, two, if it goes to any of the corners, I've lost, right? Like, this learned how to exploit me. Um, so if I, I go to 1, 0, which is that top middle one, I block it, and now it has two lines that it can win with. Um, but if you go in the center, it ties every time. Um, but let's just, let's see us lose. Nice, we got defeated. And uh, you can see all this crazy output is uh, the policy, the value, and the visit counts. It's a lot to take in, and you guys are doing great. Um, it took me, this is literally like, I've spent multiple months trying to understand and implement this, this algorithm. Not like straight, but like, you know, I've been doing it on and off. Um, so that's the workshop. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, Um, the way I've got this set up is every time it wins and goes to a better version of itself, I have it save. Um, but you could do things like if it's tying most of the time, that's a good stop case. Um, but just for this one, I, I wanted to run it as long as possible. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, where to find the previous slides? The what? The slides. The oh, yeah. Uh, we will post these slides um, probably on our Facebook. 
uh, or via email. So they all go out to people. Mm -hmm. And then you'll have, if you're interested in this stuff, there's a GitHub that has all this stuff and you can try and apply it to other games because it's the same algorithm will work for any game. Um, there's obviously, there's probably a bug or two in here, who knows. There's, there's this great quote by DeepMind where uh, every time we, we found a bug, yeah, like it increased our, our runtime by like t times two, which means people at DeepMind have bugs, which is just great, right? Like they're doing the best they can and they still have bugs. Just makes me feel good. Um, so yeah. Oh, I did have one. I think we talked about this, but so I use a flattened representation. You could also use a convolutional neural net. That would probably keep some interesting information. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Also, if you're interested in reinforcement learning, you can learn straight from the guy that championed this project. He has a, a course online on reinforcement learning, which is just cool. We live in the future. Um, it's just one of those, I think it's from the University of Central London. It's just on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you all for coming.